Good morning. Thanks very much for the opportunity to put this talk together. It started with a kind of long running theme of mine that we need to think more about the mechanics of how we manage regeneration. And then I came across some papers that suggested it's 40 years since I wrote the report to committee in Glasgow recommending the finally not letting any more of the Hutch E houses. So how do you deliver complicated regeneration, the focus and delivery, which we've had in the last few weeks as well in, in other speakers. A little personal history, 1978, this goes back a long way. I hate to think how old I'm getting. I joined the council's housing management department and got quickly got involved in a lot of problems that we had with system build housing and became known as Mr. Dampness in the council. More of that later. 83 moved to the town clerk's office as an area coordinator in the new area management system they'd set up. And in 86 set up the officer working group for Gorbals, complementing what was um, beginning to shape up for the Crown Street project. And then in 97 transferred to DRS and then left Glasgow in 2003. Although I came back later, um, that's not part of the story. Crown Street's still not quite finished. There's a couple of sites in Crown Street which are not quite um, cracked yet. So it's sort of generational change. And I thought this um, kind of picked it out quite nicely as a kind of metaphor between the 1950s, 60s tenemental property and a bit run down and this Oscar Marzaroli photograph and then picked up in the public art in bronze in, in the New Gorbals. Okay, the Hutchie E saga. Started out with grand aspirations, such as the popularity of the new houses that a high proportion of the district's former residents are moving into bright modern flats where before stood their outdated homes, so said the Scotsman. Considerable emphasis has been placed by the planners on landscaping and green areas around and between the blocks. And that's after they were uh, beginning to get derelict. The Hutchy E dream for the technical people, 12 seven-storey deck access blocks and two multis over a thousand flats, French Tracoba system built in three phases. First tenants moved in December 71. Within months, they were beginning to become problematic. By, so it was in December they moved in, within a month or two in the spring of 72, first complaints of dampness coming through, which simply grew and grew. And by 75, a rent strike, Council tried to educate people on how to cope with condensation. Um, investigations were set up, consultants were brought in, and then the agreement not to relate damp flats. I can remember having a discussion with my boss saying, well, you want me to write this report saying we're not going to relet them, but have you any idea what you're going to do with all the empty flats? And they hadn't any idea what they would do with all the empty flats, but it went ahead anyway. They then they had ex gratia payment system for, for tenants that had suffered dampness. And then vacant houses, what do you do with them? Demolition finally approved in 84, but having spent a lot of money in houses that had barely lasted 10 years, how do you pay for it all? We had looked at various options, um, treatment perhaps, uh, coping, dry lining, and um, maybe even looked at reducing three floors off the top, but hugely costly. And with the reputation they had, would anyone want to move in and, and, and let them? Barrett offered the council £1,000 a flat, but that was turned down, probably for ideological reasons. 1985, though, offers came in for a mixed-use development, a large shopping centre. But both of these were called in and turned by the regional council as contrary to the structure plan. They were trying to get some managed system for retail in the city. And it was evening times, in fact, that finally was the turning point when it accused, I accused the council of being bungling and incompetent and said the only approach at that point was the bulldozer. They'd been lying empty for quite a number of years and probably it was the word asbestos that really triggered um, activity and demolition started within months. The council put together a development brief interestingly enough for completely different more suburban style housing and by 1987, the first hint of interest by SDA in the area. That's the sort of thumbnail history of, of, of Hutchie E. I think it's kind of important to get a grasp of just the scale of the scandal for, and, and the disaster politically from the council's point of view. But the 80s were a decade of, of change. 
we had the regional council and the district council following reorganisation. We had Scottish homes being set up, New Gorbals Housing Association emerging, GDA as the local development agency as part of then Scottish Enterprise, and then the Crown Street project formally being established. But the political context was, was very interesting um, and important, I think. Labour had lost overall control of Glasgow, and at that point it always assumed it would run Glasgow for a brief period. And at the end of that, Margaret Thatcher got appointed for the UK as a whole. So we Labour got back in in Glasgow, and with a lot of other local authorities found themselves in a degree of opposition to the national government. But Labour getting back in in Glasgow came with a view that they had to learn some lessons, reconnect with residents, involve them more in the city, decentralise services and get more connected. And that was the basis for the area management system being set up in 1982. I mean, there were three areas south of the river, so there were huge areas. Um, wasn't a kind of place-based system altogether, but it allowed a place focus to, to take place. So we didn't call it that at the time. Interestingly, there was also an independent inquiry into housing set up in 1985. Um, the council quite sure that it would report and blame Westminster on a lack of funding. But if you appoint an independent chair, you get an independent view. And um, while it recognised funding might be an issue, it also pointed the finger back at Glasgow and said, you've been mismanaging your houses for years, not doing enough repairs and maintenance. Um, maybe you should look closer to home as well. So what were the issues? Huge problems of distrust and suspicion. There had been battles for years over Hutchison Town E with the council. Ideological issues, as I say, between the council and, and national government. Tensions between the region and, and the district council. Some of the usual problems that you have in any situation of regeneration, population decline, reputation, the multiple deprivation issues. And of course, for all Hutchie E was the focus of it. All the other areas in Gorbals, to a greater or lesser extent, had problems as well. A number of them were featuring on the list of dampness problems too. And underlying all of that was one of the big issues that the regional council was still committed to delivering the southern flank of the motorway. What's the new or fairly recent M74 extension? In 1984, a new local planner was appointed that was committed to the area, uh, Ron Smith. He's retired now, he's with me, still a friend. Um, and, and Ron spent most of the rest of his working life in the council, one way or another, connected to Gorbals and Oaklands. So very committed to, to the area, and he was working on updating the, the local plan, which probably took about five or six years to actually get finally adopted. The working group set up in 86, and it was in 88 that finally the, the district council persuaded the region to reroute um, the reserve line for the southern flank, essentially along the same line as the motorway cor as the railway corridor to the south of Gorbel. So that sort of freed up the opportunity for, for real um, change and regeneration. And the first of I had a number of sort of mantras almost that uh, I kept reminding colleagues of in the council. If what went before demonstrably failed, more of the same is not likely to be the answer. You'll see why that's important later. So Crown Street, the, the step change was when GDA got involved with the council and Scottish Homes and the new New Gorbals Housing Association in putting money in, putting effort in, and coming up with uh, working on a new vision for Hutchison Town E, uh, the Crown Street project. Had its own director, an on-site office that gave it identity, steering group at, I don't think you can get much more senior level than was on it originally, Stuart. The aim, the aspiration was to be an exemplar. I'm not quite sure we've ever really actually risen to it quite the same way. Maybe now beginning to get back to um, trying to, to sort of aspire to the same outcomes. Had project management consultants to, to really get on with delivery. Unusually for the city, it came up with a competition base for a master plan, and it was committed to community involvement. Even given that most of the immediate community had been uh, demolished, the two multis survived, and then it was surrounding areas. 
and the second, but the second of my kind of themes, if you like, with the council was that for all Crown Street was going to be a mixed 10 year project with some shops, it was set within a wider community. And it by itself would never be enough for Gorbals. It needed to, it needed to work, but so did the rest of Gorbals if Crown Street was really going to be a success. So joint working in some way was required for, for the greater good. And by this time, the, the working group in Gorbals had been going for two or three years. So the Crown Street working with, on everything, trying to piece together, if you like, a new jigsaw for, for Gorbals. The Area Management Committee gave the whole operation a kind of political legitimacy and credibility helped to get that political buy-in. If you remember earlier, I was saying that, that there were still voices in the council very concerned about the idea of privatisation, of not the council not running all its own houses. So there was some concern about something like the Crown Street project being set up with a commitment to, what was it, 75% private, 25% social rented. The officer working group later transmogrified from being just a few council officers into pulling in the region, inviting the project director from Crown Street Housing Association and others. And that in itself was a bit of a uh, leap for some in the council. Our approach was an informal agreement to work together. There was no separate legal entities, no bureaucracy. It worked so long as it worked for its members. Interestingly enough, when the government set up the social inclusion partnerships later on, they got bogged down, I would say, in huge amounts of bureaucracy to become separate entities and have their articles and all the rest of it. I think we probably got more done by simply agreeing to work together. Our approach tended to be as inclusive as possible. And I think also fairly crucially, we had an area budget. Now the area budget was for the whole area, but given that Gorbals was the worst part of it, probably a third to a half most years got allocated one way or another to Gorbals. Not big in the grand scheme of things, but it was a useful kind of lubricant to make things happen. And then it, along with Regional Council Community Development Funds, the Urban Programme from the government, and GDA and Health, funded a whole lot of issues to support the community. So while the big physical change projects were being put together and happening, there was an ongoing support one way or another for a whole plethora of local community projects to kind of keep the community supported. Some of these have changed their names, some have gone, some have re-emerged, re some are still there and going strong decades later. Some were council initiatives like we funded the kind of science week in schools. Um, always remember that one year the theme was flight and we got someone in with birds of prey and with a golden eagle flying around the great space of the St Francis Centre um, to the delight of the kids. We supported also a lot of community facilities that the local councillor once called gang huts because there was a kind of, they tended to give local identity to very small community areas and our long-term objective was to try and get the community I suppose to become more cohesive and not want the kind of local device of little spaces. It was also of course driven by funding as well, limited funding, so fewer better facilities was the, the kind of um, goal. The play barn is still there, I think it's now in its third location as part of the Lauriston project. It's been incorporated in such a way that if it ever moves again, um, new housing could go on the site or it could just remain as a small park. And there were bigger projects too, there was the Adelphi sec Secondary School converted to a business centre, Part of it knocked down in space for the swimming pool and sports centre. Gorbals Initiative was set up for employment and training. Um, a lot of these supported by GDA and the council. The two max listed building, listed converted to offices. Two listed libraries converted. The A listed St Francis Church and Friary converted. We did feel that there was so little left of the old Gorbals that it was important to try to find new uses to get a little sense of continuity and workspaces and office premises. Most people were always going to be able to potentially walk to city centre and work in the jobs pool in the city centre. But we did feel it was important to have some effort to have local jobs and have that kind of mix of regeneration. And funding packages for these knitted together as best we could when whatever sources we could.
Alongside all of that, there were other things. The council refurbished an SA and Scottish Homes refurbished what was going to be retained of the better of the social housing, sometimes in, in very large scale refurbishments and remodelling. It supported the master plan for Queen Elizabeth Square, which became a sort of second stage to Crown Street. Similarly, the new Gorbals Housing Association master plan for Hutchinson Town East. And then we supported the initial development of proposals for Oaklands, which itself had a whole string of priority problems to be, or, or constraints, if you like, to be sorted out first. Part of it was in the British Oxygen um, Company Hazard Zone, the M74 route, which became the East End Regeneration route, uncertain for a while. Do we retain or reroute the main road through the area, which cut the housing off from Richmond Park, upgrading the park, major problem of contamination still around in the area, and then a long-term flood risk issue. And there were two approaches we took to try to instill a sense of accountability. One was kind of internal accountability, if you like, kind of annual conference that we, we met. It also was an opportunity for folk like architects and other consultants that were maybe one step removed from the day to day or had a focus on a particular project to be involved and see the bigger picture. And also we produced a, an annual report. The, we only actually, I think, ever got four issues out. So it wasn't altogether annual, but it was a huge exercise putting it together but it, it was widely distributed uh, as a means of keeping the community and potential developers uh, informed. And I saw it as a kind of Bible for those involved in Team Gorbals. It was also, if we're honest, a, a means of trying to say, your day job and your silo in the council might be to do X, but you've got a, 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 another job, which is to work in a different team across agencies in Gorbals. So the, another of these mantras that the whole should be greater than some of the parts and we needed to work at it to make sure it was greater than some of the individual parts. But it wasn't altogether straightforward. One of the local councillors, oh, well, why should we involve the region and other agencies? Surely the district council can do all of that. That was kind of one of the views early on. When you got invited to be involved in the Crown Street project and be on its steering group, that kind of mollified that view. But there were other views still arguing that the council should continue its traditional role of a very large landlord. Development control on the roads, so that's district and region, were opposed to some of the Crown Street proposals early on. They had to be negotiated through. Landlord of Queen Elizabeth Square Shopping Arcade opposed it because, well, effectively the new shops were going to undermine them completely. Can we trust the, um, we set up an umbrella group, well, the, the community set up an umbrella group with urban program funding and council support. We were surprised it got government support, but it did. And we then invited, they had a full-time officer, a kind of advocate for the count, for the community to sit in their working group. But there were all sorts of views saying, but can we trust them? Or can we trust the community with the information they're getting? We might be getting secret information or something at our meetings. So that was, we, we argued that through and said, yes, we've got to trust them. And yes, you know, it's important that they're part of that sense of a kind of teamwork approach. In 1994, we, we proposed setting up urban design seminars with Strathclyde University and, and the, the, the Deputy Director of Planning, I remember saying, my department does that. But my boss, the Deputy De Town Clerk said, yeah, but that's hubris, let's go ahead with it. So we did. And I always remember two things. I mean, not very many of the community turned up, but some did and were quite interested. But I always remember the area housing manager afterwards saying to me, I never understood what you were banging on about the importance of urban design. I now get it, that it actually is quite important. So, you know, misunderstandings between the silos that we just don't know are there uh, is important too. We set up research and wellbeing with Strathclyde and Geography Department, but it used focus groups and it quoted some of the focus groups, one of which was a little critical of the local councillor. He didn't like it. It didn't see the light of day. So you, you win some, you lose some. Other challenges. I did make an effort at one point. To, I did feel quite strongly that having a secondary school was quite an important part of trying to regenerate the whole of Gorbals and that ultimately it probably would have a population to support one, but it might have supported one, not two and we needed to have a denominational and a non-denominational. So 
we lost that argument. Early on, there was also a proposal for a, a foyer, which was a kind of newly innovative idea for youth housing and employment. At that point, we're very risk averse to anything that might uh, kind of destabilise what we're trying to do. And, and we, we, we didn't go for it. I don't think Glasgow still got one. Um, with hindsight, I think it probably would have been quite a good idea. But at that point, our, our risk was, was quite high. There was a proposal also that the, um, what became the demonstration project across the river for City of Architecture and Design at one point should be located in Hutchison Town. And that was seen as a kind of top-down imposition. Um, so that was successfully resisted, rightly or wrongly, with hindsight, it, um, but it, it was. And then um, after Crown Street, there was quite a debate that went on for, for a long time about which area would be next, Oatlands or Lauriston. And quite a lot of probably abortive work was done in both um, until the decision effectively was made that Oaklands would, would start up first and then um, Lauriston, although when you see the problems with Oaklands, it probably didn't get on site much earlier than, than Lauriston. Just to pick on two or three examples of the, these kind of problems of, of delivery, and I, I focus these, I think they are important aspects of all of this. Despite the Hutchie saga, the council committed to refurbishing the Queen Elizabeth Square next door and spent quite a lot of millions of pounds putting a new lid on, a new roof on, um, and doing various other improvements, including a new community facility. But by 1990, that, if you may remember, was more or less when Crown Street Project was being set up, it decided not to throw more good money after bad and elected for, for demolition. But even then, there was some conflict among the tenants about whether to demolish or not. Fairly minor. Some of the tenants were decanted into the, you can see in the picture, the, the sort of yellow panelled blocks above the shopping centre. They weren't part of the demolition. People were moved in there. And then, of course, what happened, the next step was we're going to demolish the shopping centre in these houses. So they had to be decanted again. Forward thinking, long term thinking, sometimes needs to be worked at. And then Dokomomo, uh, the, the Committee for the Modern Movement, attempted to get Crown Street, list, uh, Queen Elizabeth Square listed, Basil Spence buildings. And finally, there was a fatality during the demolition project. Um, so uh, a, a, a very nasty re reminder of the, the risks as well. Or take St Francis Centre, A-listed church and friary. The, the, the population had declined so much, the Catholic Church no longer needed three uh, churches in the area. One that they'd been going to keep in, to, to the um, east of Hutchison Town uh, had major structural problems, so it was demolished. They had a newer building at St Luke's, so they kept it, and this one was um, available. For, and the council wanted to keep it. And with the region and district together, just before the end of regional council days, they pieced together funding that the housing association got the friary for amenity housing and the council got St Francis Centre as a new community centre. But even then, there were some issues. I, I asked the, the community development uh, people, develop community education to specify chairs for the, so they came up with the usual 10 pounds or thereabouts plastic stacking chairs. And I sort of said, well, if we spent millions of pounds in this A-listed building, I don't think that's quite right. Asked the architects who specified 200 pounds designer chairs, but they then managed to source something a fairly designer-ish, but more like £100 a chair. At the opening, we we'd staged the usual opening. We invited the great and the good and the architects and the people that funded it and the councillors and all the rest of it, as, as usual, to, to drinks and nibbles. But something went wrong with the invitations and the local community assumed they were invited to and turned up, um, which, which was great. And I remember one of them afterwards saying to me, we never usually get invited to these things. It was very good of you to do so. Um, and I smiled, probably went a bit red in the face, but didn't enlighten them that actually it hadn't in fact been the original plan. The other thing was we knew right from the start it was going to be no ordinary community centre. And we set up separate mechanism to, to run it with its own logo and everything else. It was going to be a one-off different centre. But um, when things changed probably a couple of decades ago now nearly, reverted to being a community centre, run as just another community centre, same council badging as usual, um, 
and it's now something of a liability to the council because it's not been used anything like its potential um, and it's probably losing quite a bit of money to and then there was another one was this, uh, we used to hold our, 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 our monthly working group meetings in Crown Street in, in St Francis Centre when it was finished. So that we were on site, it was a kind of fo fo focal point for what we were about. Always remember a Monday morning, 10 o'clock, and one day the social work manager who worked locally came in a bit flustered, a bit late, very apologetic and said, you know, the first thing on a Monday morning that I do is check out how many kids were taken into care over the weekend and how many women went into a, a respite because of domestic violence or something. And that sort of grounded us again in, in some of the kind of key issues that we shouldn't forget about when we're thinking long term, 10, 20 years. There's the immediate as well. And then there was one point when the Catholic Church, when the church had been done up, thought it'd be quite nice to get it back again, which possibly would have happened for a consideration of several million pounds. So it's still in the council. Well, have we learned the lessons in Oaklands? Perhaps once all the issues were sorted out, it went through, there was a, a fairly a detailed Oaklands action plan and design guide. Some would argue too detailed, but it was there. The development competition went ahead. It's a different mechanism for funding to Crown Street. But there were, there were only two bids came in, one about 80% more housing than the other. Both were evaluated by the council. And in fact, in fairness, the council rejected the, the bid that didn't hold to the brief. And apparently they were separately evaluated financially. And while you might assume that the one offering much more housing would have offered much more funding, apparently it didn't offer an awful lot more money. But anyway, I mean, for what, you know, the council, instead of the usual of, well, we want, you know, more, it, it did accept that had a brief and it should stick to it. What are the lessons then? I've tried to kind of summarise some of the, the, the lessons quickly. I think we need to factor in managing the process of collaboration. It's messy, it needs to be managed, it needs to be encouraged. You need to find ways through bureaucracy and the people that oppose things and find ways round and through and over and under the, to, to get things to happen. It's important to stitch together teams across the silos. Um, with a common vision and make it actually quite a bit of fun to do it so that people actually want to be there to make it happen. That relies on trust and trust between the individuals and that has to be consistently earned. Although things like the area budget I do think can incentivise teamwork. Um, very often we would get one department saying well we'll put in this bit of our budget and someone else might say well we can put a wee bit in and I would say well we'll put a bit of the area budget in. And some of the bigger projects, there's one in particular in East Hutchison Town, we funded it all over two years. So it was about six different bits of people's budgets to piece together enough funding to do the job to a high standard. I think empathy is important with an area, really understanding, understanding the local stories and narratives and the kind of hidden voices. Regeneration happens in a local matrix of what's happening every day and part of our supporting community organisations locally was recognising that the ordinary has to go on. Some people you know, would never benefit from, older folk would never benefit from some of the long-term vision stuff. They needed to get something out of it sort of then and there. We had an incremental approach, but it built momentum. So there was always something, eventually something new following on. And there was a kind of sense that we need to think through the logic of change, that, that there needs to be a mechanism, an outcome, but there needs to be a logic to why we expect it to happen that way. We had a form of distributed leadership, I suppose, in that each agency had its own leader. They were accountable to their own committees or boards. All we did in the mid middle was kind of coordinate it all and try and make sure that it went at the same time at the same speed, slow some things down, speed some things up, make sure the budgets were stitched together and so on. It's complex urban regeneration, it's complex because it's complex. And much of that's political, institutional, social and human, not just the technical and financial. And then finally, I think there are times I look back and think, well, we're just lucky that we had 10 to 15 years of political stability, of institutional stability and of personnel stability. And we should be building homes for 100 years. So it's important to take a bit of extra effort, I think, at the beginning. And then 
another, the final slide is a recent um, public art in Oakland, which is sort of the pages of history and a young girl looking forward.